This is At the Public Library, the video source for news and information about the San Francisco Public Library system. This month's show features a look at the Tibetan Sacred Art and Books exhibit now on display at the main library, a listing of Chinese New Year celebrations at neighborhood branch libraries, and an encore presentation of a branch profile featuring the Excelsior Branch Library. All this and more coming up on At the Public Library. December 16th through March 15th, the Main Library's Jewett Gallery welcomes Tibetan Sacred Art and Books, an exhibition which celebrates an outstanding collection of works compiled by Dharma Publishing in Berkeley. Located on the Main Library's lower level, the exhibition displays Tibetan sacred art portrayed in intricate wall scrolls used for meditation and visualization practice. Also shown are the technical means of preservation and the human commitment that has made such an endeavor possible. We had the opportunity to speak with the exhibition coordinator, Barry Schieber, about the exhibit and the work of Dharma Publishing. The Tibetan Sacred Art and Books Exhibition uh, represents 25 years of research and 25 years of uh, scholarship collecting the books of Tibet. After the Chinese invasion of Tibet in the early 50s and 59, uh, many of the texts were lost because the uh, Chinese destroyed about 6,000 monasteries. And the remaining texts, the few that got out into India, were in jeopardy of uh, being destroyed by humidity and heat and dirt and the dispersion of the, all this type of knowledge. Tibetan texts were on uh, block prints, so each single thin sheet of fragile paper was sandwiched between two boards. So you had a body of knowledge that went back 2,500 years to the Buddha and had been handed down faithfully all this time that was in danger of being lost to the world. So Tarthang Tuku Rinpoche, who headed this whole project, who was a Lama in India at the time, having left Tibet, and came to America to help preserve this whole body of knowledge. It turned out to be a vast research project, a vast printing project that culminated at the end of 1995 in 755 atlas-sized volumes of books. That's the largest Tibetan Buddhist uh, text in the world, the largest collection. It's a compilation of well over 5,000 texts. One set is 755 volumes, and we printed 108 sets. So that's 80,000 volumes, and each book weighs about five pounds. And it's printed on acid-free paper in the finest ink available. And as you can see by looking at them, they're just beautiful books. But the research effort behind this project is as large as basically cataloging the Library of Congress from start. It's huge. I mean, there's so many different texts from different times. And in Tibet, you know, you'd have a monastery in one remote area and even though in mileage it might not be far, you'd have these huge mountain ranges between monasteries. So it was kept very separate. It was very, the knowledge was very dispersed. This is the first time in history that all this has been collected, put into one large edition that will benefit so many people in the future. We think we've preserved about 75 to 80 percent of, of the text of Tibet. So Dharma Publishing, this is only one part of what they do, but it was clearly a, the a purpose is to save this a whole endangered culture or this, this ancient body of wisdom. One of the, our purposes is each year we have a, a, a peace ceremony in Bodhigaya, India, where we take the text and return these to the Tibetans and the people living in the Himalayan effort. So it's really a wondrous story that this began in India so long ago, 2,500 years ago. It finally makes full circle to its manufactured and produced here in California. And then we ship it, a vast shipping effort, back to the peace ceremonies. And these texts are returned to, to uh, lamasaries and monasteries and to practitioners of Buddhism, because you need practitioners to explain the text. The whole project, you know, it's a 25-year effort. There was research done. There was just small things. What type of paper do we use? What type of printing press do we use? How do we stitch it. Stitching was a big deal. We ended up with a 17th century method of binding the books called the French groove binding method. 
So we went back, you'll see in the video, our stitcher was made in 1905. It was sitting in someone's warehouse in New York. And we wanted to stitch these books so that no pages would fall out. You know, with durability was essential. So we went back, we looked at it, they said, yes, you could do this, but you'd be able to produce about one book a day. And we had 80,000 books to do, so we said our timetable is a little shorter than that. And we figured out through working with all this how to do 40 books. And this continued to happen time and time again. People said, this can't be done, and we could do it. Then we gold stamped the covers. I mean, step by step, anyone who knows the printing process, there was a tremendous amount of detail. So you'd have to have huge critical path. How are we going to get the paper here? How is it going to be stored? What are the logistics? How do we move these books away? The side? You know, a set of books is two elephants or some size like that. How do we do this? It was a massive organizational and leadership challenge. Some of these are mandalas. This is mandalas here. Some of these are paintings of uh, Buddhas. And these are very much instrumental in the whole text. Each text, the first 120 volumes, or the first 108 volumes, contains a tanka. And these are what these are called. These are called Tibetan tankas, which are wall hangings or wall scrolls. They were used for visualization practices and meditation practices. They go hand in hand with the text. Getting these particular paintings that are so beautiful and so colorful, we had to write museums throughout the world. Looking over here on this wall, I know these came from Bhutan, which are very unusual tankas. Most people haven't seen this type here. Some are from Tibet, and I don't know the location of the originals. Some may have been sent by museums or libraries throughout the world. Surprisingly, uh, in Europe, there was quite a few tankas, quite a few tankas in Scandinavia and around there, and they sent us I mean, it was, you can imagine, you'd mail it, you'd ask a request, and then they'd say, well, you know, here's the conditions of it, and we'd take this and reproduce it. And we also have a whole array of maps here, of, of early maps of how this whole uh, transmission from India, where the Buddhism started, how it got to Tibet, and why it was safe from about the 11th century. Once it got to Tibet and the Himalayas were so high, it was really a culture that didn't go out very much as far as activities went or knowledge went because they were very self-sufficient. It was a beautiful country, it is a beautiful country. And it took uh, really the invasion of China before all this knowledge became dispersed. So I think what you have here is you have a very good introduction to first of all the preservation of, of sacred knowledge, which is very important. Um, I think we all know how to respect text, but sacred is a whole other level of activity, what a sacred text would really mean. And also you have all these beautiful images, symbols, signs that people connect with regardless of their beliefs. And you don't have to have any belief. People, there's just something about that people connect with. And, and I think that's very important. And I think people appreciate that. I think the maps themselves are very interesting for people like that. We have timelines and we have a description of it. But the video itself really explains sort of where this knowledge began, why the preservation, where we are in this transmission of this knowledge so it becomes established here in the West. This transmission is going to take a while because the texts are primarily in Tibetan, and the translation work will probably take another generation. Those are 10 feet temple hangings, probably by about three or four feet. And we put those in the atrium of the library and also right here before that, mainly because they're so colorful, they're so attractive, people get very curious and also very traditional for people who know about this. And here in the Bay Area, a lot of people know about that, so they see these, they associate it with Tibetan. But Tibetans use very vivid colors and these just seem to capture people. I think they're really victory over suffering. Maybe there's something deeper than that, but I think people just like the way they're made. There's something sort of mystical, prim primordial about them. Whether your interest is mystical or historical, religious or artistic, come see it for yourself. The Tibetan Sacred Art and Books Exhibition, now through March 15th in the Main Library's Jewett Gallery. Catalogues and many reproductions from the exhibit are also available at the Friends of the Library store, located on the second floor. An illustrated slide presentation on Tibetan tankas and mandalas will be given by Rosalind White, Art Director of Dharma Publishing, on Wednesday, January 14th at 6 p.m. in the Main Library's Corette Auditorium. The following Wednesday, January 21st, Sylvia Gretchen, Research Director for Dharma Publishing and Dean of the Nyingma Institute, discusses the processes and efforts involved in the preservation of these rare texts, 
also at 6 p.m. in the Main Library's Corette Auditorium. Come celebrate the Year of the Tiger at the San Francisco Public Library. Chinese New Year celebrations will be taking place this month at branch libraries throughout the city. Come join the fun with a Chinese lion dance and martial arts performance. The festivities get underway on Saturday, January 17th at the Sunset Branch at 10.30 a.m. The Ortega Branch at 11.30 a.m. The Parkside Branch at 12.30 p.m the Merced Branch at 1.30 p.m., the Noe Valley Sally Brun Branch at 3 p.m., and finally on Saturday, January 17th at the Portola Branch at 4 p.m. Then on Saturday, January 24th, the Chinese Lion Dance and Martial Arts Performance will get underway at the Excelsior Branch at 10.30 a.m., the West Portal Branch at 11.30 a.m., the Ingleside Branch at 12.30 p.m., the Ocean View Branch at 1.30 p.m., the Visitation Valley Branch at 3 p.m., the Potrero Branch at 4 p.m., and the Bernal Heights Branch at 5 p.m. On Saturday, January 31st, the Chinese New Year's celebrations will continue at the Marina Branch at 10.30 a.m., the Richmond Branch at 11.30 a.m., the Anza Branch at 12.30 p.m., Park Branch at 1.30 p.m., the Main Library Children's Center at 3 p.m., the Chinatown Branch at 4 p.m., and the Year of the Tiger celebrations at the San Francisco Public Library will conclude with the Lion Dance and Martial Arts performance at the North Beach Branch at 5 p.m. From all of us at the San Francisco Public Library, Gung Hei Fat Choi. Hi, I'm David Schwabe here at the Excelsior Branch Library with another At the Public Library Branch Profile. Built in 1967, the Excelsior Branch serves the large and culturally diverse Excelsior and Outer Mission Districts of San Francisco and was one of the last neighborhood branch libraries to be built in the city. Located on the edge of the busy Excelsior District Commercial Strip at 4400 Mission Street, the Excelsior Branch opened to the public on October of 1967 and was officially dedicated on June 12, 1968. The simple modern structure with its straight lines, peaked roof and large reading room window was designed by the architectural firm of Appleton and Wolford. The original construction cost of the branch was just under $322,000. The branch contains 8,200 square feet of floor space and is capable of holding up to 53,000 volumes. We have what's called an open floor plan in our library. The, the children's area, while separate from the adult, is an artificial separation. There is no separate complete room or separate floor. Um, it's, it's a one floor branch, no, no basement, no mezzanine, and um, it's just a, a book wall that separates the adult space from the children's space. The branch also has a large meeting room that's used for branch programming and is available for community use. A meeting room is one feature that the two previous storefront Excelsior branch libraries did not have. Branch library service has been a part of the Excelsior since 1925. Well, the first one was on Ocean Avenue, about 7,500 feet off Mission Street. It'd be only go one direction, Ocean Avenue, and that's towards the ocean. From there, it starts there. Um, I used it as a child, and uh, that lasted for so many years. And then the Bank of uh, Wells Fargo Bank wished to expand, and they expanded into the area where the library was and built a new branch. And then they moved across the street from the present branch, which is now um, a foot doctor's office. And that was quite a large uh, branch. The store was about 20, 25 feet wide, about 100 feet long. So it was a big improvement over what was up the street. So I can sort of thank Wells Fargo for uh, moving us out. Uh, I used that library. I was uh, present at the dedication of that library when uh, Mayor Robinson dedicated. It was a, a, a very successful affair. 
On October 21st, 1966, Mr. Jebby, along with Mayor John Shelley, attended the groundbreaking ceremony for the current Excelsior branch, which had come about through the efforts of concerned and dedicated Excelsior residents, especially Mr. Jebby. It's interesting, the thing that encouraged me to do this, I was in business just up the street in uh, Jebby's camera shop, and accidentally I had learned that this part of the city, this outer part of the mission, had the largest number of school children than any part of San Francisco, which of course took in City College, there was nothing on Ocean Avenue, a little small branch, and over in Bayview, the little small storefront also, all the way out to Daly City, the biggest branch was uh, down in the mission and a little one up on Cortland Avenue. And we had the largest amount of school children and one of the smallest libraries. So at the time, I just sort of got interested in it. And um, over a period of 10 years, uh, at the beginning, I got a, an attorney to write up a petition for me. And I went to all the churches, all the schools, and all the meetings I could think of, raised about 28,000 signatures. And uh, over a period of 10 years, wore out two mirrors to anybody who would listen to me. And we ended up with this building here today, which I think is very, very nice and I'm very happy with. This sounds sort of like an uh, you know, old patriotic cliché, but I feel everybody should have books available and they should be able to read and study and do whatever they wish to do to better themselves. There is a, a good-sized general reading collection. Um, there are moderate collections in teen, which is a large population for us. We're close by two middle schools and one high school, um, as well as private schools. Um, a moderate collection and the only branch collection in Filipiniana, which is material um, principally in English, although some is in, in Tagalog, and there are dictionaries for some other languages of the Philippines, too. Um, for Filipino-American immigrants, um, information about the Philippines and also information about Filipino culture in this country. Um, the only other collection is at the main library. And we have a, the second largest in the branches Spanish collection and with that goes a, a small Latino interest collection, a collection of materials in English of interest to Latino Americans. And associated with those are magazines, a newspaper, videos, um, audio cassettes. Then, then our third language, collect, language interest collection is the Chinese collection, um, which is small but growing as the population had been small and, and is now growing. So we're hoping to um, put a lot more of our budget into materials in Chinese since they are very, very popular. Um, we, we buy a lot of material that goes into the adult collection but it is, is known to be of interest for, um, for students because we have very heavy student use both at the, the high school level and at the junior college level since we're so close to City College as well and we're also not that far from SF State. Um, so we buy a lot of, of extracurricular materials, um, not textbooks, but materials that help to back up the curriculum in a, in a school at that level. There's, there's a reference collection, certainly we're, we're a resource brand so it's a, a somewhat sizable reference collection. Um, and it's, you know, it's separated out from the rest of the collection, too. Most of it is out on the floor and browsable. Very little of it is behind the desk and paged. We have, you know, a large children's collection as well. And, and within children's, the, the languages of the community are also represented. There is a, a sizable Spanish and a, and a Chinese collection there. The Excelsior branch also has a growing video collection that includes nonfiction, how-to videos, as well as popular movies. Patrons will also find a varied compact disc collection, a collection of books on tape, language learning cassettes, and a very popular children's video collection. The branch provides access to the internet and a large number of online databases through the San Francisco Public Library's computer system. The Excelsior branch presents a variety of programs for children and regularly schedules film programs, story times, and lap sits for toddlers. Occasionally, the Excelsior branch will present programs of interest for middle schoolers and teens, like babysitting workshops and a series on teens and the law.
On the first Saturday of each month, the Excelsior Branch hosts a citizenship workshop in Spanish and English, sponsored by La Raza Central Legal. We began this, this program um, a number, maybe four years ago, three or four years ago, um, when we wrote um, grants to the State Library to beef up our, our very small, at the time, Spanish co language collection. And so in, in announcing that we had gotten this grant and we had new materials and we particularly wanted to emphasize the citizenship aspect of the collection, um, we added this program and it was very successful. Uh, it, it's given by, um, t not by our staff, but by teachers from La Raza and um, they, they also give it at the main library. Um, and it's, you know, it, it goes up and down. Sometimes the attendance is small, sometimes it's large, very large, but there's always attendance and um, people, people are always very grateful to find out that there is something like that in their language um, that, you know, to assist them because it's very hard to, to make it through the morass of becoming a citizen um, on your own. The Excelsior is the largest branch library on the southeast side of the city and serves as the resource branch for the cluster of branches that includes Visitation Valley, Bernal Heights, Portola, and Bayview Wadden. As the resource branch for this cluster, the Excelsior branch is open and fully staffed seven days a week. When our hours were altered at the beginning of um, Prop A, um, our staff had to dramatically increase to be able to, to meet a seven day three night operation. Um, so we now have four full-time and two part-time librarians of the four full-timers, two are adult, two are children's librarians. Um, we have two technicians and a, a library assistant full-time and three part-time library assistants. Of those six people, five of them are bilingual or trilingual in languages of this community and we have made a real effort that that would be so, that we would find and seek out people who did speak these languages. And um, the librarians are a more limited crew. We don't, we're not able to find as many linguists among the librarians. We have one Spanish speaking librarian at this time and no Chinese speaking or, or Tagalog speaking. Um, but we've been, we've been luckier with the technicians and assistants. And uh, we started out with 10 pages and now we're down to five. Um, we, that's, that's been a terrible loss for us. We've had a hiring freeze for the last year or so and um, haven't been able to hire pages, can't hire them now. Um, they're, they're also a part of the, um, the speakers of languages for us. They are the youth of this community for the most part. The pages usually hire on in branches in the community that they live in. So they have real community ties. They're, they're the children of the community, become young adults and they speak Spanish and they speak Chinese and they, and they speak Tagalog and, and that's been a real blessing for this branch in communicating with our patronage. Over the last few years, the Excelsior branch with its versatile and talented staff and a solid collection of resources has experienced a sharp increase in circulation and usage. The large functional design of the branch allows the library to easily adapt to the changing needs of the diverse community it serves. I'm David Schwabe for Branch Library Profiles. See you next time. The story of the San Francisco Public Library System, from its simple beginning with a collection of 3,000 books to the recent completion of the state-of-the-art new main and civic center, has been chronicled in the beautifully illustrated book, A Free Library in This City. Written by noted author and historian Peter Booth Wiley, a free library in this city also contains specially commissioned essays by noted Bay Area literary figures accompanied by original artwork by noted local illustrators. The illustrated history of the San Francisco Public Library, a free library in this city, is available at all San Francisco Public Libraries and may be purchased at local bookstores or at the Friends of the Library gift shop in the New Main. A Free Library in the City was published pro bono by Weldon Owen Publishing to commemorate the opening of the new main, and all proceeds from the sale of the book benefit the San Francisco Public Library. For your information, SCORE, the Service Corps of Retired Executives, 
is a national organization of retired business executives that provide technical and managerial counseling and training to people starting or operating a small business. SCORE will be offering free one-hour business counseling sessions every Wednesday from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. in a study room of the Business, Science, and Technology Department on the fourth floor of the main library. The library is offering free workshops about obtaining American citizenship. Sponsored by Centro Legal de la Raza, the citizenship workshops are on the first Saturday of the month from 11.30 a.m. to 1 p.m. at the Excelsior Branch Library, and every fourth Saturday in the main library's Latino-Hispanic Community Meeting Room from 10 to 11.30 a.m. All the workshops are conducted in Spanish and English. All Library Commission meetings are held in the Corret Auditorium on the lower level of the main library. The San Francisco Public Library Full Commission meets the first Tuesday of every month at 5.30 p.m. The Finance, Operations and Building Committee meets on the third Tuesday of the month at 4 p.m. And the Planning and Policy Committee meets the third Thursday of the month at 4.30 p.m. If you've got some legal questions, the Volunteer Legal Services Program of the San Francisco Bar Association offers a free legal advice and referral clinic the second Saturday of each month in the main library's Latino-Hispanic Community Meeting Room at 10 a.m. And for you Russian readers, the San Francisco Bibliophiles meet for their monthly book discussion group from 2 to 4 p.m in the main library's Latino-Hispanic Community Meeting Room on the last Saturday of every month. San Francisco Bibliophiles is sponsored by the Book Arts and Special Collections Center of the library. And finally, the library system will be closed on Monday, January 19th in observance of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up, live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream my poor little children one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that we will be free one day. When all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last. To read more about Martin Luther King Jr., check out these titles available at the San Francisco Public Library. Martin Luther King Jr. To the Mountaintop by William Roger Witherspoon. Let the Trumpet Sound, The Life of Martin Luther King Jr. by Stephen B. Oates. And Martin Luther King Jr., a documentary, Montgomery to Memphis, edited by Flip Schulke. The main library has a large collection of non-fiction VHS video cassettes available for borrowing. Included in the collection are programs about Martin Luther King Jr. and the Civil Rights Movement. Thanks for watching at the Public Library here on City Watch Cable Channel 54. You can catch at the Public Library Monday mornings from 9.30 to 10.30 a.m. and from 12.30 to 1.30 p.m. Friday evenings from 8 to 9 p.m and Saturdays from 12 noon to 1 p.m.
See you next time.